All right. Good morning, or whatever time you're viewing this. Uh, I'm Nancy Frischberg. I'm one of the organizers of the Linguistics Career Launch this summer in 2021. And with me is... Robin Battison, who was recruited for this by Nancy Frischberg, my former <laughs> colleague. <laughs> and longtime friend. We're going to talk about how people thought about the idea of careers outside the academy 40 years ago, because that's when we have the best records from. There may have been other things previous to that, but I don't recall. So here's a brief history, a brief history of some of the uh, thinking about alternatives to careers in, in the academy for linguists in the US. Uh, in 1974, at the Georgetown Roundtable, that was the 25th, um, I was there. Were you there, Robin? I don't think you were there. Uh, Roger Shai told us, and I think this is still true, linguistics suffers from not having a natural apprenticeship domain, making it difficult for graduates to find work. And then he recommended that we break into jobs in all these different fields. And... Uh, so that was 74, that's more than 40 years ago. In 76, the Center for Applied Linguistics said, the supply of linguists at the doctoral level will continue to exceed demand as faculty for academics institutions. That's more than 40 years ago. And uh, in 79, CUNY declared a program called Applied and Urban Linguistics. And I'm not even sure exactly what the content of that graduate program was, but they felt that it was uh, related to this theme of non-academic careers. The thing we're gonna spend a little bit of time on is the one day program, but one day meeting uh, in December of two, of eight, <laughs> I can't even say the words, 1981, um, in conjunction with the annual meeting of the LSA it used to be held the week between Christmas and New Year's. And that year it was in New York. And the theme of this one day program was, or the title was Careers in Linguistics, New Horizons. Let me, uh, if you can see me here, I don't know, I'm gonna hold up the printed version of the transcript. So this was audio recorded, somebody typed out the transcript of all the different presentations. And it looks like this, so it's old fashioned typewriter. Oh, and I remember typing. Yeah. You remember typing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think um, Mary Niebuhr, I think, was the one who did that, right? I think that's correct. Mary Niebuhr did that. The meeting was organized by Donald R.H. Byrd. And I went looking for him the summer and realized that we missed him by a year. He died in the, in the summer of 2020. And I'm very sad about that because I think he would have been thrilled to see what we're doing today. We are, in a sense, realizing the dream he had. And he was an applied linguist. He did a lot of textbooks for, I mean, I read his obituary and he wrote like dozens of books about language instruction in different languages. So very productive and very interested in non-academic careers for linguists. Um, uh, Sue, can you talk about linguistic enterprises? Sue Steele, I'm yeah. introducing here. Okay, um, who's also on the organizing team and has been both an academic linguist and employed outside the academy. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, Janet Fodor, who was the president of the LSA, was right. very interested in this problem. Um, and her idea was to create a, a website that would have some information and a place that people who are looking for non-academic careers could go and she asked me to put it together. Um, I don't know why exactly she asked me, but she did. And so um, at that point, I was, a, I was a visiting scholar at Berkeley and I hired a graduate student to, to do the work. I actually don't know whatever happened. You know, I mean, so we put this website together and and um, you got a lot of hits, which was one of the things that motivated you to say there is a demand. Yeah. So, but right. I don't know. I mean, but it just sort of, as far as I know, disappeared. I don't, I mean, I don't, the LSA didn't keep it up. After, I probably, after Janet disappeared, there was no more impetus. 
I mean, she so didn't appear, but she she as a leader of the LSA yeah. went on to the other things, and somebody else came, rotated in, and that and, whoever that was or whoever the next people were didn't yeah. find that a priority, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I would say then the next thing I'm aware of, and I don't want to claim that this is an exhaustive list, but these are the things I'm aware of, and as you can tell, I've been paying attention off and on for a long time. Um, I know that I was part of a gathering at the LSA meeting in uh, 2015, and, and I believe that the SIG was formed either in that year or the following year, and we offered, uh, I say we, because now I'm definitely part of the SIG, but I wasn't initially, offered networking and career panels in the career mixer during the summer, uh, sorry, the winter meetings, the LSA's annual meetings, and we've been doing that for, I guess, five or six years. And Nancy, and, yes, it's Alex. If I may break in just to shout out the Georgetown Masters in Language and Communication program. Was when was that founded? 2007 were mm -hmm. our first graduates of that program in applied professional sociolinguistics. That was a program that was developed by Debbie Schifrin, famed sociolinguist. Right. And based on the history of Georgetown uh, with Roger Shai. Uh, sure and the interest in professional applications of linguistics. And in fact, the SIG was formed by former directors of this program in language and communication, which focuses on careers outside of academia and business government, nonprofits. And <clears throat> right, so it only took from Roger saying it in 74 until sometime, whoops, between the things that I've got, the last two items I've got mentioned, right? So that was a long time of, a long gestation. Can I say that? Um, and I will be happy to insert that into the final version of these slides. So I appreciate your mentioning that, Alex, because I didn't remember when that was formed. So how far have we come? Uh, we've got this one month program where we've got about 200 people who are being exposed to these ideas and trying to figure out how to achieve liftoff out of the academy. And so I wanna share with you what happened in that one day event and what and the lessons I learned from that to be able to improve it so that when we put together this one month event, it was significantly different in our expected outcomes, okay? If you were to sit down and read this book, you would find there are, uh, that there are a number of different speakers who talked during the day. They were divided into morning and afternoon sessions. And I'm gonna show you the table of contents and a bunch of call outs, which is my editorial opinion about what the speakers said. Please, I hope you've had a chance to read it. And if you haven't, I uh, encourage you to look at it um, and you'll find other things. And I hope you tell me other observations you make about those presentations. So call outs that I've, you know, the way in which I've uh, represented each speaker's talk is by a call out and like a little speech bubble. And if they have a solid line, my opinion is that there is some continuing usefulness to the remarks or they were practical even in those days. And the ones that have dotted lines represent remarks that are noteworthy, but they don't necessarily point to actual jobs with a career ladder that learn, use skills learned with linguistics training. I've used color as decorative only. Don't, it's, if you're colorblind, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean anything. Okay, now I'll see if I can stay straight. Okay, so here's the table of contents and I'm looking at the morning session and I'm hoping you can read some of that. The, Arthur Bronstein, who was head of LSA for a long time, started out in speech and hearing sciences and moved over to found the linguistics department at CUNY, that's the City University of New York, was the moderator of the morning session. And he talked about the theme, what linguists can do. Then we had Frederick Misch talking about lexicography. And the memorable comment from him is, you may be familiar with Frederick Misch. He was the uh, editor of the Merriam-Webster Dictionary of the English Language for many years based in Hartford. Uh, lexicography is not a growth industry. It's fun and it's a good job for linguists but not a growth industry. W.O. Baker spoke about computers and he mentioned four, at least, 
areas that linguists might participate in where computers were making headway in all kinds of information processing. Uh, Frank Macchiarola, and I believe he was associated with the city of New York school system, the K-12 school system, talked about non-teaching parts of, of education. And he said, find some, let me get the Zoom controls out of the way. He says, find some appropriate skills that can be taken to that job. But he didn't actually say what skills we might have that were so appropriate. Um, Tracy Gray, I found very compelling because she talked about policy and language planning. And what she said was, there is a plan for how you go about making change and getting other people to adopt policy changes. She said, know the legislators, keep them informed of what you're doing, know the legislative schedule so that you know when it's a good time to give them new information and to support the old information they have and find some organization that you can join with that will help you promote whatever the policy efforts you wanna promote are uh, that are related to your efforts. The reason I say I think this is wise advice is it's certainly the way uh, policy gets changed for nonprofit organizations. And when I realized that I said, oh, this is what we need to do in dealing with the LSA. We need to pay attention to the executive committee. We need to keep them informed. We need to know their legislative schedule. That is, what's the, when do they make decisions? How do you get on their agenda? How do you present to them and, and convince them that all whatever change we want to make is a useful thing? So I have kept Tracy's ideas in mind during the last two or three years as we've been moving toward participating either in the summer programs or the winter programs, and in this case, developing our own program. <clears throat> Lothar Simon, whom I don't know well, and I don't know exactly where he ended up, talked about publishing a traditional uh, landing place for people who care about language. And he talked about editing, marketing, and copywriting, all of which are fine careers, but they don't necessarily pay a lot, um, depending, and depending on what part of the publishing world you're in. And Alan Westaway spoke about translation, and I was surprised that he did not, um, he talked about the UN and the UN has six official languages, which I think is still the case. Uh, but the UN is not a pragmatic solution for people who have multilingual skills. There are so many other places in the community, and I think we see them more obviously now, where translation skills are needed, but he didn't talk about interpreting. So I distinguish between interpreting, which is live simultaneous or consecutive in, you know, translation, and translation, which refers to written work. And I think that's the habit in the industry. So I found his remarks a little less than compelling uh, because he didn't refer to things outside of conference interpreting. High prestige, but not necessarily the high volume. So let's go on. We took a lunch break. I hope you had a chance to stretch a little in that lunch break. And we went on in the afternoon to talk about what linguists are doing. And Richard Tucker was the moderator for that. And you may remember him as one of the authors about uh, uh, Quebec bilingualism, French bilingualism in Canada. Uh, who was the second author with him? Well, uh, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but I remember the two names together generally. Okay, so we were introduced to Norma Reese, who urged us to think about speech pathology, audiology, and communication disorders, which certainly are appropriate um, careers for somebody who wants to go into, somebody with linguistics background who wants to go into a kind of clinical setting. Of course, you can't be accepted as a speech pathologist or audiologist without further training. That is, you, <clears throat> you probably need a master's from some speech pathology program and a supervised practicum or internship under some other speech pathologist. So that's a fine, a fine career. It's not going to get you from undergraduate school directly into a job. Stuart Flexner echoed the Mish comments in the morning and said, optimistically, there are 40 full-time jobs for linguists in lexicography. And by that, I hope you all understand his meaning, which is 
40 existing jobs, not 40 new jobs every year, okay? And I think probably there are more than 40 jobs for linguists and lexicography in the digital age because there are so, more, so many more kinds of uh, places where lexicography happens, but still lexicography by itself is not a growth industry or a, a big career for many people. Mark Liberman, who many of you may know from University of Pennsylvania, spoke about several kinds of things that we could do that linguists are doing with computers. And I think he had a similar vision uh, and probably even more well-developed than my own about what you can do uh, with computers in speech and text and artificial language design and processing, blah, 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 all those good things. Um, Robin, who is our guest here, uh, co-presenter, talked about his work in business communications and we're gonna hear a little more detail about that. Um, Bill Above had fabulous, uh, I think, platitudes, dare I say, about the issues of public, public issues of injustice and inequality that are ringing you know, true still today, but he didn't have very many pragmatic ideas of what roles linguists were gonna step into. It was kind of like you had to make your own job in order to address those issues of inequality. So I, you know, I'm, I'm all for the agenda, I just didn't see the actual jobs in that particular presentation. Um, Marsha Farr talked about language research, especially under the auspices of the National Institutes of Education. And she made several different uh, designations of places where people could be useful. However, she did not talk about how you were going to get paid Surely you can get some grants from foundations, which I found to be a um, less than adequate solution. And then we had questions and answers. Dr. Battison will now advise us and ask me to advance when you're ready. There we go. Well, thank you, Nancy, for that historical review. We're talking about the future and we're talking about transitions. And one of the things about being in a transition, your transition, is that it doesn't always feel like a transition. It may feel like a continuum. And one of the things that uh, surprised and annoyed me after I made my transition was that former colleagues and professors would uh, approach me and say, so Madison, uh, what are you doing now that you're not doing linguistics? And I would be taken aback because of course I was doing linguistics. You can't stop doing linguistics <laughs> as long as you're working with language. So there's a, there's a continuity feature there. Now, um, not yet, Nancy. No, no not I know, yet. I, I no. just wiggled keep my your mouse. Hand off, keep your hand off that dial. Yes, yes. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm imitating a Laurel now, you know. There we go. So <sighs> like, like Nancy, uh, I, I had a career doing linguistics of uh, ASL, American Sign Language, and doing the basic descriptions of the work that was done in the 1970s and extending that into psycholinguistics and even neurolinguistics, working with deaf aphasics. But then I made a transition to working with applied linguistics and text comprehension, and then on to document design, usability testing, and finally landing in international business communication, business development, and branding. So that was a, that's a long set of transitions that was there. And, uh, I don't know if you listened to Jenny Redis's talk on Wednesday morning, but she talked about one element in making transitions is often serendipity, the right opportunity came in, coming by. And my opportunity came in 1979 when Jenny Reddish, of all people, uh, offered me a job as the assistant director at the Document Design Center at the American Institutes for Research. So that was wonderful. Uh, at the moment, as Jenny noted, that uh, PCs were just coming in, uh, computers were landing in offices for the first time, and the major challenge was for computer manufacturers was how to get people to understand and use and get some value out of the computer systems that were being sold. So, of course, that involved coursework, documentation, and online information, which was pretty primitive at the time. And those are all language domains, and therefore, they're all linguistic domains. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, thank you, Jenny, for that start in life. <laughs> and uh, eventually it uh, morphed into work with many different 
uh, we'll call them sectors or domains. I mean, I've worked in IT, telecoms, software, food processing, and I don't mean food processing little grinder that you have on your kitchen counter. We're talking about food processing where you, you pour in 10,000 liters of milk into a, a vat and yogurt comes off the other end after a while. That kind of food processing. Uh, law, education, banking, financial technology, such as the building of IT systems uh, for stock exchanges around the world. Insurance, medical technology, pharma, transportation and heavy trucks. Yes, I have driven a 60 ton vehicle. Chemicals, right. defense, military intelligence, and commercial real estate. So wonderful, I got to sample all these things in my, in my... Uh, so the, the essence of that is language is everywhere and language and linguistics is therefore everywhere. And, you know, I ended up being what I am now, a very shy and retiring business writer and editor, semi-retired. There we go. And now we can have the next slide, please. All right. Dr. Frischberg. Here we go. Bing. Da, 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 da. So this is about your transition. And back in 1981, the advice that we had, what I offered in this, in this booklet, which Nancy held up, is that there's a very different mindset and setting, uh, quite simply, what goes on in what you're used to in academics and what is going to happen to you if you go into something called loosely business. Uh, when you, how you spend your time, well, you sort of do what you want when you're a student. You pick a topic, your advisor says, okay, and then you try to make sense of something. But in business, very often, you have to account for your time. You have to write it down. You have to think about planning your time in a different way because you're responsible for delivering things to others. Accountability, again, that's self-determined. Whether you do well on this and less well on that or where you put your energies, as an academic, you have a great deal of freedom. But in business, you are responsible to your manager, your team, and your customers, and maybe to your investors as well if you're a public uh, company. Individual or teamwork, the settings differ because uh, as I recall how it was back then, Linguistics was a cerebral exercise. You did it in the privacy of your own home or office, and you wrote down things on paper and then showed them to people. So, and you got rewarded with tenure or promotion or wherever you were heading at that time of your career. But in business, it's essentially a teamwork thing. You're constantly checking with other people. You, you have longer projects. You have to have them well-managed. You have a project manager. You may have dozens of people on a project you have to promote the right kind of communication and there is quality control in the best projects. Some projects didn't have quality control, but that's another story. And then what you create, what happens to your work products? Well, you create knowledge and it's, it's open. You have to make it accessible to everyone. You publish, you give talks and uh, work products in business, they're more carefully controlled and some things you generate for public uh, audiences, other things you uh, hold as internal reports. So you begin to distinguish between public information, something called internal use only, confidential or business confidential, and even the very highly restricted confidential, which means that some of your colleagues are not permitted to benefit from your thinking because they're not in a need to know. Others that need to know. And the next slide, please, Nancy. Mm. So out of all that, the changes in the business settings, the uh, advice or realizations that has some practical value at that time were that as a linguist and getting out of ling academic linguistics, you have to recognize how esoteric linguistics is. It's not something people have a conception of, of of what you're doing. And the most frequent question you'll get, I'm sure you've heard it before, well, how many languages do you speak? Because that's the essence of being a linguist, people think. Or do you translate? Okay. So it's not intuitive and you have to explain it again and again. And uh, I remember I was rewriting uh, a very important brochure for a very large insurance corporation. 
They had 20,000 people. They sold insurance. They had sold insurance, group life insurance, and other benefits to their own employees, and their own employees did not understand their benefits or how to claim them. Do you remember that, Jenny? I'm sure you do. The Equitable Life Assurance Society, who invented group life insurance back in 1911. Yeah. So I had to go in and restructure, reorganize, interview their people, find out what they weren't understanding and why, reorganize the entire booklet and move forward. At some point in there, I was talking with a vice president who controlled the whole project, and I mentioned the word psycholinguistics, and he drew back in his chair and said, psycholinguistics, psycholinguistics, in that tone. And I knew I would never repeat that word to him again because I was on the border of what he understood was rational. I have a similar story, and it probably was within the same month as, as you're talking there about. There we go. Because we have these parallel lives. There we uh, go. Where I wrote a memo at IBM. Uh, well, maybe it was a little later than that. So I wrote a memo at IBM and used the word disambiguation and was told, how about speaking English? Same, same story, right? Yeah, that is. That is. So you have to concentrate as a, a linguist in transition on speaking with non-linguists who don't understand the lingo and you have to make it into various packages. So you have to be able to talk about your work or your skills or experience, whatever is relevant in little packages. An elevator pitch to me is 15 seconds. That's the elevator journey. And you're, you're suddenly with that important person who might influence your journey or introduce you to someone. And you have a, a few seconds to tell what you're really working on in ways that they understand, two or three sentences. And if they're successful, they stop and ask for more, but that's all you have time for. So uh, again, uh, using a term I first heard from Jenny Reddish on, on Wednesday, the bite snack meal, you can have your five minute talk as well and your 10 minute talk and your 20 minute talk, the bite, the snack, the meal, according to whatever the audience is consuming at that point. I think the bite is actually the elevator pitch uh -huh. and the snack is either five, you know, a, a two minute or a three minute in a talking version. But it's all in, proportions. Right, right. So the bite is the headline. The snack is the short explanation and the meal is the white paper. Whoops, I'm pulling my headset out. Okay. So the general point is that you have to learn to adapt to a non-academic audience to make progress in the world outside of academia and learning to write and I'm saying right now rather than talk for a general audience is important. You may be a good writer, but you have to improve your writing. Um, you have to learn how to consider the context of your written product and in what context will it be read? And you have to master different styles or registers, not just the ac academic, as it says there, not just uh -oh. the academic, okay. but even the academic. Another point is that you have to get into selling yourself, promoting yourself. And other speakers have covered uh, the differences between curriculum vita or CV and resumes. They're not equivalent. I won't go into that here. But also the special role of the cover letter, which is attached to your CV, it focuses the reader's attention on your CV and briefly elaborates on the points in it, uh, the ones that are designed to get their attention. Or your resume. Or resume. resume. Yes, I meant, I rent resume. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I'm glad you're in there providing quality control. Very good. And Alex is there well, correcting. Another great thing to do is to publish your dissertation as a book length or in any other form you can to get your work and your knowledge out there in digestible chunks. And my understanding afterwards was that that was one of the reasons that Jenny hired me because I had published my dissertation. La -di -da. And again, uh, look at improving yourself. You've had an academic role and, and been educated, and you have to determine what gaps in your training or education that you have and fill them. And in, at, in 1981, uh, the idea was that programming, Oops, design, sorry. and statistics would be appropriate. But Nancy, let's fast forward to 2021, yeah. to today. Let's do, let's let's do. do that. Oh, thank you. So 
things have changed in 40 years. I mean, the internet didn't exist back then and lots of other things didn't exist. Let's not enumerate them, but some things haven't changed. Uh, I'm just describing with different words now. And today, you still have to seek relevance and to prove relevance to your audiences, to your colleagues, to your future colleagues and future employers. Because theories are not appreciated outside of academia. You have to have practical results to deliver. This means that if you're, if you're in charge of something, in charge of designing a, an educational program or uh, re redoing some documentation of something or developing a, a training program, you have to be able to motivate, uh, reach back into linguistic principles and say, why it should be done this way rather than that way. All right. Um, and of course, you have to, again, promote and uh, explain the relevance of your own work. Why was it so important if, if now you're going to be relying on your own work? Now, in the 40 years since 1981 and 2021, I finally figured out this a week or so ago that I have cracked the code. I, I cracked the code. And the realization is that Linguists are good at cracking codes. That's what we do. We crack codes. What does that mean? Well, it means that we can describe and analyze the language codes used by subcultures, such as the jargon used by company X. And you know that IBM and Hewlett Packard and other companies and Apple have completely different ways of using language that they have developed as a subculture. And if you are going to be inserting yourself into those situations and, uh, and making sense of it or helping them do something, achieve a goal, you have to understand that, that language. And it is a, a, a language. Um, you have to, linguists are good at understanding the role of context and determining meaning as well. And we're good at interviewing users about what they understand or don't understand. We're, we're good at extracting meaning from users. And of course, decoding complex sentence structures and identifying those key things, ambiguity, vagueness, and contradiction. And if you're working in edit editorial situations, then uh, that's extremely important. Now, Given that linguists are good at cracking codes and developing those things, that means that linguists are, can be, I say they are, we are good at translating, which means finding logical and semantic equivalents in useful contexts. And the context in which I worked was often an industrial company or a tech, technical company had developed a thing, a product, a service, software, something which was going to revolutionize the world, but they couldn't talk about it themselves to the people who were going to buy it, that's one level, or the people who were going to use it, which is a totally different level. So you as a linguist could be very good at doing that kind of thing, converting the technical information that the specialists have created into useful information for non-specialists in the particular situations that they encounter that information. And also converting information created for one purpose, like a technical memo, into information to suit another purpose or another audience, such as installing something or using something in a dialogue with other people. Or writing a press release. Or writing a press release, exactly. And uh, yes, don't get me started on press releases. No, no, we, we don't have time <laughs> for that now. We'll take that into gather later. So uh, some of the, the previous two points is that linguists are very suited to become generalists. You can also become a specialist in something, but think about generalists because your power is the ability to manipulate and understand language. And therefore that can be applied in many different situations. Language, rhetoric, and semantics are everywhere and you can plug yourself in anywhere. So you can even work in a specialist area as a generalist. You can work with technical specialists and help translate information from one department to another or from those departments out to their user communities or their investors or the distributors who are handling their product. 
And you can actually get quite a lot done without actually becoming a super, super specialist in their area. Um, but again, uh, there are contents of pieces which might be uh, relevant there. And you can expand yourself by expanding your tools. So learning about product development in different or, uh, industries is good. Learning about marketing and branding user design, user interfaces, usability testing, SEO, the dreaded SEO, search engine optimization and analytics would be useful tools to, to use these days. And finally, uh, getting into a content area as well is gonna give you a boost towards some employment in some areas. And I can simply cite here law, health, IT, uh, process industries and manufacturing and there's a chat thing in the middle there, and also financial technology. <laughs> and well, that's that's a journey. That's advice contrasted between 1981 and 2021. What else do we have for our public today, Nancy? Well, I'm going to take the last few minutes because I think we're supposed to end by the before the top of the next hour. And I want to take a couple minutes here to share with you some other aspects of my, uh, my thinking and other people's thinking about what's been happening, why have things moved uh, so slowly over the last 40 years. And I want to um, point out some, and I guess this is another perspective which says um, a fellow named Dan Hirschman wrote a blog post which I found very insightful and I hadn't thought about the issues in this way. And he notices that in general people live where their relatives live. They, play, they grew up in a place, they stay in that place. But academics probably moved away from the, the original place, whether for undergraduate school or even more likely for graduate school. And they may have moved multiple times because you're not gonna necessarily get hired and unlikely get hired at the institution where you studied. So you're gonna get sent away somewhere else new. And his, Dan's point was, do these facts about dislocation affect the research topics that academics choose? And do they affect the relationships in the community where academics live in or near? And I, I'm saying uh, staying in academia may not be possible or practical for some people. There are cultural reasons why you wanna be and social reasons and family reasons why you wanna be in the community that you grew up. And so you may not feel like you have the uh, you're not personally licensed in your family to make these kinds of adjustments in location that academia expects. Here's some assumptions that I have uh, come up with. I think you'll all agree with me that academic linguists hold many of these. Applied work is not theoretically interesting. And if you want a counterexample to that, I would suggest Charlotte Lindy's work. Um, Theoretical topics, especially syntax and logic, are the top of the heap of topics. Applied linguistics, which used to mean mostly language learning materials, are only related to education. Uh, let's see, text is valued over speech, written is valued over interactive or emotive. And I think this may be changing slightly, but still, I believe that we don't pay enough attention to language speech in its you know, ordinary uses and all the intonational stuff that goes along with it. We also spend a lot of time saying that language is unique and we need to consider it apart from everything else in communication. Don't think about gesture, take audio data only, ignore idea phones, and you can write fabulous academic papers. I would claim that's not, uh, that's not true to the human experience. It's wonderful for advancing linguistics in certain ways, but it, it doesn't uh, view us as situated in a social setting. Applied work is of, of less value because it's women's work. I think we should look at the population of this uh, uh, event, this one month, and I think you'll s agree that there are more females uh, enrolled than males. And you can do what you like without regard for earning a living, let alone a good living with an advanced, as long as you have an advanced degree, you'll take an adjunct role while waking, waiting for something better to open up because the, the best thing you can achieve is an academic appointment in the tenure track. 
I'm sure there are other assumptions that uh, I haven't mentioned here, and I would be delighted to hear from those of you, Abby, you may not have them at hand, but as you're thinking about them. And I don't necessarily, I'm not saying that these are wrong, I'm saying that these are limited. So maybe I'm saying they're wrong. <laughs> Um, I, I'm guessing that many people here are not familiar with Virginia Vallian and her work. She's an essayist and she's a linguist. And she asked the question in 1997 in a book called Why So Slow? The Advancement of Women. Why are women not achieving academic appointments at the same rate as their male colleagues? Because in, certainly in a field like linguistics, women are being turned out to as uh, graduates, at least in the same numbers as men. She talks about the two body problem, meaning uh, what happens if you are both academics and you need to find jobs at related or close by institutions. Uh, what happens if your partner doesn't get tenure and you do? Now what do you do? And you remember all those assumptions we had? Many of them apply to women more than to men. And who sees themselves in those desired roles in the usual time frame, and who doesn't? What happens if you don't love publishing academic papers? What happens if you don't love grading student papers? I remember um, one of the first graduate seminars we had on ASL with Ursula Bellucci and Ed Klima and our deaf consultant uh, who was trying to teach us ASL, but we were trying to do it in a way with eliciting all kinds of uh, oddball sentences, especially about negation because that was one of Ed's favorite topics. Uh, and one of the things, one of the sentences he put down on the list that week when we were doing negation was, I don't like grading student papers. And I thought, oh, how transparent of you. And how do I feel as a first year graduate student to hear you say that? Okay. Anyway, it's, sure, it's surely the case that more women are earning PhDs than the academy can accommodate. I think that's an easy truth. Let's have one quick snapshot look of the governance of the LSA. And I'll tell you what my point is. I don't think I've demonstrated it uh, quite clearly enough here, but let me tell you what this is about. If you look at the documents that the LSA has about who's been on the executive committee, it's fabulous because you can really see who was there in what years. So starting in 1925, and I I tallied this up to through 2019. I think the data are there for 20 also. Of the something like 260 people who have had roles on the EC, only this many, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of them have been from outside of academia. And then I would say most of those, there's really only two who came out of the corporate world. So that looks like about 3% of the people. But what I haven't demonstrated here very clearly, and if somebody wants to help me do a nice little graph of this, I would be very welcoming of help. Um, if you count person years of service on the executive committee, you'll see that Edward Sapir was there for so many years and Hockett was there for a certain number of years. So what I'm representing here is how many people, but not how many person years of non-academic advice the executive committee had internally. And it's way short. It's much shorter than a 3% number. So I think we have to not blame the LSA for making the decisions they've made so far, but we also have to do something about it to change it and to open the organization up to non-linguistic sorry, non-academic linguists, which is of course in the strategic plan for the years 2019 through 24 or 23. And I would like for all of you to go ahead and look at the strategic plan. It's a fabulous document. It really states a lot of idealized goals for the organization and then consider what steps has the LSA executive committee and the programs offered through the secretariat, what programs have been offered other than the ones by our SIG to welcome people from all different occupations. So here's an aspiration for the future and you can imagine the cake that's on the other side of here that we can all enjoy. 
we think that this LCL is about all of you in the audience. And I hope that we've given you a little bit of insight about where, what we're coming from and how you're going to advance your careers. And I'm hoping that by 2025, the hundredth anniversary of the birth of the LSA, that we can double its size because it will have opened all its borders to include linguists from all career paths. And that then implies that we've got some work to do because the current program offerings need to be augmented to include events and publications and mentorships and all kinds of things we haven't mentioned that will be of interest to that new membership who are beyond the academy. That's one vision. I hope that other people will come to add to that or create alternative visions. We're ready. Miriam asks if we know how many people, have, how many women have been on the LSA's executive committee over the years. And I haven't counted Miriam, but I, I would be delighted. Um, and <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm gonna stop sharing for the moment and interact with humans. And I'd be happy to entertain questions and comments from career linguists and from the participants in the summer program. This is Ginny, if I may. Absolutely. So I was a member of LSA for several years uh, after I finished my linguistics graduate school, but I dropped my membership because what you got was language, which um, was still intellectually fascinating to me, but not at all relevant because the articles were so deeply academic and uh, the meetings also. So my question is, um, has LSA done anything to welcome non-academic linguists by publishing something for members that included material from non-academic careers or had sessions that were relevant? Uh, so I have been very involved in other professionals organizations since I left. Um, LSA because they matched my non-academic career. So I mean, as, I'm just curious as, what has happened. As have I, it. yes. Other than the stuff that the SIG has been doing, I am unaware of other programs. Anybody else want to chime in? And Alex, didn't we hear from somebody within the last week about getting published in a non in non-language place for the work that they were doing. I can't remember too many new uh, factoids. I think that I agree with what you say about the journal language as a sociolinguist that hasn't been a journal that I, I turn to since it's uh, deeply formalistic. Um, there's I have an inkling of a, a change of foot, which I probably shouldn't say in a recording. <laughs> <laughs> we have That's some, not bad words. You can say it, <laughs> not, but it's private information. And, yes, it's confidential, um, right? It's confidential, but I I think with certain members of the EC and certain members of the new committees that are forming, um, Coggle and Coggle's not a new committee, but it's being reformulated with new outreach and with the formation of the new social media committee, there are members on the EC who are very open to what we are trying to do in the Linguistics Beyond Academia SIG. So there are signs of change within the leadership of the LSA and the executive committee. Um, but as far as language, and language may have um, a bit of a change coming. <laughs> okay. There. Right. So, I mean, uh, I think the fact that we keep hammering on it <laughs> may help and that we are communicating with the EC may help. And I, every time I talk to them, I invoke the strategic plan. I hope all of you start doing that also, because that's their promise to us of the direction that the organization will be taking. And, and I want to hold them to it and I want to help them develop rubrics that they can meet and know whether or not they're uh, satisfying their audience, which is academic and non-academic linguists or people. Well, Nancy, who, Nancy yeah. why, why not send them a copy of this video? We, we will. And we're, we, 
we also invited them to come to this session. And I keep every week, I'm sending them little notes about you would be interested in these sessions. And I hope that at some point they will show up or take the opportunity to view them when we post them later. I hate to stop this because uh, it was, uh, it's, I think it deserves a lot more comment and a lot more interaction about it. And so perhaps in our next uh, mixer, we can chat more about it. And if you're interested in carrying on, I could use some help with graphs and calculations. And Miriam's already offered to start the calculation on how many women have been on, on the EC, which is certainly not in the first 50 years. There were a zero, I believe is the number, but since then there have been more. Um, and I thank everybody for showing up. And yes, we did record, unlike what we had been saying. So we didn't use any bad words. And I think we were relatively polite and please do fill out the feedback form. <laughs> Relatively polite. And Alex says, of course, here it was. And uh, sorry you didn't get the memo. It's Hawaiian shirt day. <laughs>